So welcome to That Bigfoot Show. Yes, that one. Today we have a very special guest, Jason McLean. He's, yes, he is. He's very special. This guy has written several books. He's an amazing artist, and he has quite a few interesting, controversial theories regarding Sasquatch and, uh, you know, just how the world works in general. So, um, what do you say, Jason? Let's, uh, let's talk some Squatch. All right, let's do it, man. Hi, my name is Jason McLean. Uh, I'm an artist, illustrator, and biblical paranormal researcher. You can find me at Amazon and anywhere books are sold uh, with Metroplex Monsters. Dallas Demons, Fort Worth Goatmen, and other terrors of the Trinity River. And you can find me every Monday on Texas Front Porch. On our most recent outing to Brown Springs, we had a really interesting series of encounters that for one second looked like it was Bigfoot. It's the right place. Lots of people have seen Sasquatch in that location. But when we looked at the phenomena under a closer microscope, what we noticed is while there may be Bigfoot sightings in the area, there was other paranormal phenomena. And when we started looking at it, we started noticing too much overlap. And so what I'm, what we're thinking is there's more phenomena that's being called Bigfoot that isn't Bigfoot and has actually convoluted this whole conversation. So while, you know, my, my experiences in this, in the strange are more towards the physical, I, I'm now leaning towards a paranormal answer for at least many supposed Bigfoot encounters. For example, how often do you hear of Bigfooters running around saying, well, I saw a dark shadowy figure with red glowing eyes. Sometimes they'll even call it eye shine. They have recordings of language that they didn't maybe hear when they were out in the field. They have photos of creatures they didn't see when they were out in the field. You take all that phenomena, you move it over right into somebody's house or onto a bridge and it's poltergeist activity or it's shadow people or it's any number of paranormal phenomena but you take that exact same phenomena move it to the woods suddenly bigfoot i think the problem that we have is for decades now we have we've corrupted all of our data with physical bigfoot and this paranormal material that we're calling bigfoot but isn't and that's why we're not getting anywhere with our studies, right? We're trying to find, we should be getting closer and closer to it, but it seems like we're getting further and further away. So have you ever seen a Sasquatch or Bigfoot-like creature? Not personally, I haven't. Um, my experience was with a living Ramphoractoid pterodactyl. They are smaller than say the Pteranodons that, you're, that most people are familiar with, but they've been seen for thousands of years. They've been seen very consistently in North Texas and other locations. The wingspan is only about eight to 10 feet long and they have a long tail. But the point is I did encounter one and it's made me realize the world that we live in is very different from what is purported by most people. Uh, and so it left me open to exploring these other phenomena, these other creatures, because I wanna know what the world that we live in really is. And so that got me into Sasquatch. It's gotten me into other phenomena, other paranormal phenomena as well. You know, I, I believe in God. I believe in the goodness of human of humanity. But this is a science question. Either the creature exists or it doesn't. And that does require, it requires evidence. But I do think the more we've gotten into it with uh, the group that I'm with and some of the people I've spoken with, it is becoming clear that there is a lot more to this phenomena than we're, than we're giving it. So everyone's familiar with the Fort Worth Goatman, aka the Lake Worth Monster. It's the late 60s, mid late 60s, and we've got Jim Mars writing these reports, seen by numerous people, of a creature, broad daylight, human-like, some sort of man animal. It's all over the news, people are freaking out. Well, we all know that story, it's a very common story, it's, it's very detailed, but what it did was it made an indelible impact on the lore in and around Dallas Fort Worth. Suddenly everything became Goatman, right? Where when you do just a little bit of digging, you find that there are stories of a large unknown creature prowling 
the creeks and rivers down in and around the North Texas region. Uh, it was the, it was called the creature, it was called the monster. It would go up Waxahachie Creek, it would go up Red Oak Creek. It became the Hinky Man in DeSoto. It became all these different things, but then in the 60s, it all becomes Goat Man. But what that told me, once I was able to sort of scratch beneath that surface and realize that the name Goat Man uh, had sort of just taken over all of these other previously existing stories, it became clear this wasn't a new phenomenon. It wasn't like Goat Man just appears but because of Jim Mars, but rather Jim Mars simply gave a new name to a much older uh, you know, grouping of, of encounters that people have been having in the North Texas area for literally centuries. And the closer you get into it, you start noticing something really, really interesting. And it's a consistency that I'm, that really won me over for the phenomena in North Texas. These are again, not new. They've been, this stuff's been happening for centuries now. People have been talking about it in Texas for centuries. And these stories go back further than just the goat man of, of Lake Worth. It's, it's materials like that. Consistency of description, tall, hairy, bipedal, you know, broad daylight sightings. I had one uh, account of a woman personally known to me who saw it in broad daylight just drinking water out of the Trinity River. We have another daylight sighting of a creature, again, literally coming up to a the house and to the backyard of a, of a person who lives right off of the 10 Mile Creek. Again, where there is a long-standing tradition of what's called the Hinky Man, which is basically, when you get into the folklore aspect of it, a combination of Bigfoot and Krampus because of the Czechoslovakian uh, families in the area. It's it's very interesting when you get into the lore, but I don't want to digress too far. The real question here is why am I open to the belief or open to the idea of Sasquatch being a physical creature? And for me, it's consistency, right? We've been seeing this creature in the area for centuries now, and we've been seeing them in the same place for centuries. This isn't new. It's old, very, very old, but they are migrating from Fort Worth out to East Texas and seemingly back. And we're seeing them over time. We see them in the same places. And that's the kind of stuff that leads me to believe that these things are real. They are physical. They are tangible. They're natural creatures. They're just enigmatic. They're just unique. And they're unknown to us. And who doesn't love a good mystery every now and then? But the, it goes back even further. The American Indians long have a, a storied history with, of contact with them. The Caddo called them the Stick Indians. They consider them to be nothing more than just another tribe living out in the woods. Just They were just another tribe, just different from them. Um, others did see them as something supernatural, and that's an interesting topic. But one of the theories, and one of the reasons it, I, I wanted to address it, is it's very, very common as an explanation for Sasquatch activity is this idea of American Indians, uh, even today, going on spirit journeys to learn the ways of the earth, to become shamans, um, that they may sort of become what are called feral humans, because this is a tradition that is accounted for. I really wanted to show the difference here, right? Because what we have here are three different things. We have, uh, this is a rendition of a traditional medicine man on an actual journey, right? We have photos of people who have undertaken this journey. Uh, over here, this is a gentleman, he's a modern shamanic uh, practitioner. He actually created a suit, a, a suit of, of clothing to sort of represent him uh, becoming one with the earth. And that's what this is. These are not merely wild animals, but they're also not simply humans who have decided to not shower for a couple of weeks. These are unique creatures and they deserve our respect in that light. Like I said, at the end of the day, I'm not really chasing Sasquatch per se, I'm chasing knowledge. But it does beg the question, what is it that's really going on in Bigfoot's head if they, if they do exist? Are they monsters, predatory, waiting for us to slip up so they can abscond with a child or one of our wives? Or are they just our cousins who are just wanting to see what the, what the other side's doing? How does the other side live? 
Maybe they're not even interested in us at all. We're just in their way. Maybe they're just apes that have realized that they're better off without us. Maybe they're humans who have decided to return to the earth and think that they're better off without all of our modern fanciful accoutrement that we spend 40 or 60 hours a week working to afford, destroying our families. I don't know what they are, but I would like to know. I think ultimately what we're all looking for is whether it's Bigfoot or living dinosaurs or a nat or normal a commonly accepted animal that some researcher is looking into. I think we all just want to know where do we fit? How does this all work? What does it all mean? Why do we care how the crow flies or where it flies off to? It's because we want to know. We, we think if we can put it all together, maybe we'll have some real answers in life. I would like to think that some of these more exotic animals have that same little bit to offer us. Maybe knowing a little bit more about them allows us to know more about who we are and what we mean to this world. Maybe even what we mean to each other. Well, so what is Sasquatch from a biblical perspective? Honestly, it's hard to know. There's a couple different theories. The if we go with the paranormal world, some people think he's a Nephilim. I believe he's just an ape. And ultimately, Sasquatch or a, a pterosaur, none of, none of these individual things matters one whit to the Bible. Some people would even argue that the Sasquatch is actually mentioned in Job, that they're the sons of fools uh, that, that live in ri dry riverbeds and bray like donkeys. Some people see that there. For me, though, the broader field of cryptozoology, I think, does speak to the Bible because it's about the biblical worldview. Then we see a mass cataclysmic event that reshapes the planet, and everything that survives is a lesser version of what's found on the other side of that, of that line. And we would expect to see certain animals that would seem odd to our, to our eyes, living dinosaurs, maybe even something like Bigfoot. If it is something like just a Gigantopithecus, then again, that's supposed to have been extinct. It shouldn't be here. I think these creatures are, indi are indications of the worldview that the, main, the mainstream scientific community purports to have is incorrect. When it comes to the paranormal stuff, again, the Bible's a paranormal book. It has angels and demons and uh, all kinds of supernatural beings interacting with us. They talk to us. They affect us physically. They make us sick. They make us healthy. They have their own agenda. They want us to worship them. They want to draw worship to God. They torment us and they free us. We see in the world around us, we see animals that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be alive, but they are. We see creatures moving through walls, people being taken. We see things that we see all the way back at the beginning of Genesis 6. For me, cryptozoology, whether it's Bigfoot, living pterodactyls or, 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 the, or paranormal phenomena speaks to a broader biblical worldview, a worldview that is different from mainstream science. Do you get any flack from Christian communities or crypto <laughs> communities for these beliefs? All the time from both sides. Um, so to the people that I know who, and, and people who come across my work who aren't into cryptozoology, I'm, in, I'm an insane Bible thumper who's into Bigfoot. For the Bigfoot community, I'm an insane Bible thumper. From the Bible thumpers, I'm an insane cryptozoologist who wants to bring all this other stuff into the Bible. No one's happy. And that's how I know I'm doing the right thing, right? What, what's the old, ex, the old adage is uh, compromise, you know, you've compromised when everyone's unhappy. I don't expect that people, from any perspective, look at what I'm doing and say, that's it. That's the way it's supposed to go. Because it's not how the world works. If you're really onto something that matters, if you've, if you've really come across that right idea, you should expect the entire world to look at you and try to push you down. Because what you're doing is you're upending old paradigms. You're, you're, you're taking that box and saying, this is the wrong box to be in. Let's take you out of that box. And that box has made a lot of people very very comfortable and also a lot of money, right? Um, you know, regardless of the Christian side or the cryptozoology side, 
what I'm saying kind of makes a lot of people uncomfortable because it's calling a lot of sacred cows into question and no one freaks out more than when their sacred cow gets gored. Yeah, no, I do this because like I said, I want to know what the world really looks like. I think once we have all the pieces put together, it'll make like a uh, one big finished piece. Some people say it's a puzzle. Me, I think life is like a drawing. At the end, it just comes together.